Sometimes military war zones had to be negotiated, and we are seen here awaiting takeoff from Beirut with a military outpost guarding the runway. Here we are shown passing through Bahrain. Sometimes the ablution facilities are a bit of a culture shock. And here we have a bathroom typical of that throughout Asia. My first introduction to one of these was at the end of a hot and sticky flight, and I probably smelt of it. So my host offered the use of his bathroom to freshen up. I looked at this arrangement, and after soaping myself down, decided that the only way to rinse myself off was to climb into the tub. Problem was, that left behind a lot of pretty grubby water. I found out later that you did not climb into the tub. Instead, you were supposed to use the saucepan to throw the water over yourself while standing outside the tub. The tub of water would then remain clean for the next person. I don't think the lady of the house who followed me would have been impressed. <coughs> Keeping the work area of the confined cockpit space tidy was always a problem. My flying uniform consisted of a lightweight shirt, a pair of cotton shorts and a toweling hat. The hat was actually the most useful, shielding me from the sun, absorbing perspiration, and I also used it to clean the windshield and wipe the engine oil dipstick. <laughs> Due to weight restrictions and lack of room, I was not able to carry much in the way of clothing, therefore it was necessary to hand wash a change each night and hang it up to dry in the cockpit as we flew the next day. The cockpit tended to look a little bit like a Chinese laundry. It would be foolish to believe that what man makes is perfect and I have experienced seven engine failures necessitating a forced landing plus countless partial failures of engines and aircraft equipment. In addition, there is the prospect of sabotage. Some of these pictures show a CD4 forced down on a beach north of the Kaipara Harbour. I had just set out across the Tasman Sea bound for Thailand when a rocker arm broke, causing the engine to almost shake from its mountings. I had to quickly shut it down. Fortunately, the tide was out and I was able to glide back to the beach and land the overweight, fuel-laden aircraft on the hard, wet sound without damage. <coughs> Investigation suggested that a V-cut had been filed in the rocker arm, weakening it and causing the failure. Had the failure occurred a few months later, I would have been in the sea. Repairs were carried out and a couple of days later, I flew off the beach and was on my way to complete the delivery. The ability to survive a, de a sea ditching was remote. Even my one-man survival dinghies were subject to sabotage. After this incident, two were later found to have been slashed with a knife, with the result that upon deployment they sank. This Fletcher ZKUSA, also seen here, that I was delivering to Los Angeles, delivered a partial engine failure between Christmas Island and Honolulu. For seven hours, with no valid engine instrumentation, I juggled the engine controls, nursing a very sick engine, keeping it going by feel, sound, and intuition. After limping into Honolulu, it was found that the intake manifold had broken away from the engine. The engineer who carried out the repair in Honolulu said it was a mystery to him that I'd managed to stay airborne. Sabotage, hard to say, probably just poor workmanship. <clears throat> This aircraft is in Darwin having collapsed oil rings replaced. And this aircraft also in Darwin having its alternator replaced. This aircraft is showing having its fuel injection system cleaned out at Auckland Airport. I had just left for Australia when the engine lost power and began to run very rough. I had to turn back just making it as far as Auckland. The engineers found that three of the six fuel injection nozzles had been blocked off by contaminated fuel. Once repairs had been carried out, I continued with the delivery. On another occasion, I had to make an emergency landing in Sumatra with a fuel blockage. It was found that a fistful of masking tape had been dropped into the fuel tanks and this eventually blocked off the fuel flow. <clears throat> in this aircraft, I commemorated Sir Charles Kingford Smith's crossing of Tasman in a Fokker VHUSU by flying from Wigram in Christchurch to Sydney, refueling and then back to Christchurch. We had named this aircraft ZK USU. A couple of weeks later, after a quick paint job, I flew the aircraft to Egypt for evaluation. 
I did not carry out the actual demonstration, but when these were completed, flew the aircraft back to Australia. On the way back, while crossing the Arabian Gulf, an oil line broke, and eventually all the oil was pumped overboard. I managed to nurse the aircraft into Karachi Airport, had the aircraft prepared and carried on to deliver it to the owners in Armadale, New South Wales. But keeping my family advised of my well-being through normal communication methods was impossible. No news meant they worried for my safety. To counter this, a network of radio amateurs around the world would continuously monitor my progress through my own amateur radio that I installed in the aircraft. Every hour on the hour while airborne, I would contact an operator somewhere who would then relay my progress back to my wife Joyce in Hamilton. Sean here is a Canadian operator, Shorty Mac, waiting for my call. And this slide shows my amateur equipment sitting on the auxiliary tank behind the pilot's seat. Installation of my radio gear in the aircraft was illegal, but authorities turned a blind eye knowing that my equipment was far more reliable than the aircraft system. Radio hams often relayed progress to aviation authorities when the aircraft radio equipment broke down. Joyce is shown here monitoring reports on my home equipment. On many occasions it was possible to speak to her direct and this was tremendous. Quite candidly, without the support of the radio hams, I would have been unable to carry on. Some experiences were quite amusing and finding a telephone in a toilet, I couldn't resist taking a photograph of myself, pretending to take a call while otherwise occupied. Sometimes delivery duties were not concluded until I had given instruction to customers' pilots. Here we have a group of pilots in Thailand waiting for me to check them out. And here is a similar group in Iraq. I would have to dismantle the ferry gear and take out the extra fuel tanks before the pupils could come on board for training. In 1978 it became obvious that the company's fortunes were deteriorating due, in my view, to company mismanagement. There was a distinct lack of cohesion between the workforce and the board of directors who had little appreciation of the vagaries of aviation. They had foolishly shafted the original managing director, Alf Coleman, whom the workforce respected and failed to understand international aviation marketing. I resigned my position and returned to Dimmock Machines as branch manager. I did, however, continue with the remaining deliveries on a casual basis. This is one of several additional aircraft I delivered to the RAAF. They were originally built for the Rhodesian Air Force, but that deal went bad due to a trade embargo at the time. When that job was completed, James Aviation asked if I would attempt to sell their large holdings of second-hand aircraft. These were trade-ins that in James' current economic situation were causing some financial difficulties. Naturally, I accepted, again on a casual basis, taking leave from Dimmix as the need arose. I was highly skilled in the area of sales and marketing and proved very successful in moving this debilitating stock. This was fortunate for James because of their precarious financial position and for many months it was only my sales that placed sufficient funds in the kitty to pay the staff wages. Initially I was engaged on a casual basis but was then asked to join the permanent staff as a sales rep. How could I resist? The prospect of flying a vast selection of single and multi-engine aircraft was too good to pass up. So I left my secure, well-paid job at Dimmix and returned to the uncertainties of aviation. The company's aircraft sales manager sold an aircraft to the Goodman Group and to me fell the task of flying it out from the USA. After attending a conversion course in Wichita, USA, I flew the aircraft of each craft Super King Air, shown here in Toronto, back to New Zealand via the Atlantic and Europe. Joyce and the owner's pilot accompanied me. He had also attended the course. Arriving back in New Zealand, the sales manager informed me that he had resigned and upon my question who was to be the new manager, he replied, you are it. I really didn't want that responsibility of that position, but I did accept. 
partly was I settled into my new job when a concerned managing director came into my office brandishing a demand from the Beechcraft factory that James cop up several million dollars for some aircraft we had supposedly ordered and they had built for us. I had no knowledge of any such orders and certainly no potential clients. So I was dispatched post haste to the Beechcraft Works in the USA to try to sort this problem out. After three days of very heated dialogue, during which James Aviation was subjected to some nasty threats of legal action by some very high powered factory officials, they agreed to cancel the order without penalty provided we purchased one aircraft from their inventory. I agreed and selected the cheapest one available a last year's A36 Bonanza at a reduced price of $150,000. It was much better than several million. This particular aircraft was shortly to become quite significant in my career. Who had placed the multi-million dollar order? A James director with no authority, but no doubt carried away with misplaced enthusiasm. Shown here is Jean Batten during a personal visit to my home in Hamilton. When an English woman, Judith Chisholm, broke Jean's London to Auckland record set in 1936 a couple of years earlier, I had decided that given the opportunity I would try to recapture it for New Zealand. Now I had the opportunity and decided to fly the A36 out from the US via the Atlantic and the UK and leave London on an attempt to recapture the record. The Bonanza was slower than Judith's pressurised turbocharged Cessna Centurion and a little faster than Jean's Percival Gold shown here. So I figured that I would have to keep rest stops to a bare minimum for any chance of success. And I planned on two five hour breaks, one in Calcutta and one in Darwin. Unfortunately, I was to be denied the Darwin rest due to a refueling foul up, which took several hours to resolve. Leaving Lakeland, Florida, I flew up to Newfoundland, across the Atlantic to Ireland, and then on to Bournemouth from where I intended to start the record attempt after a short stopover for servicing on the Friday. On the Monday, the flight commenced with a diversion over an airfield close to London in order to be officially recognised. Refueled at Athens and Bahrain, arriving at Calcutta on the Wednesday. Here I refueled and slept for five hours before continuing on, refueling at Penang, Darwin and Brisbane and arriving in Auckland on the Saturday having demolished the previous record by 50 hours for a total elapsed time of the 105 hours. Strangely enough, <clears throat> while I had managed only five hours sleep in over five days, I was not unduly tired. On the way down from Auckland to Hamilton, I was met by my old around-the-world aircraft CXU, piloted by Clyde Thompson of T.R. Moody, and accompanied back to Hamilton. CXU, Miss Jacey, is owned by the Thompson family. They believe the aircraft to be of historical significance. Life was good. I was enjoying the work and was successful to boot, making a favourable impact on James Aviation's fortunes. But that was to change. Not long after filing a report cautioning against high expectations, believing there was going to be some tougher times ahead, I was surprised to learn that the company was planning to expand. When I was told officially about the restructuring, I responded that James was being driven in the same direction as New Zealand Aerospace, down the plug off. Three ex Air New Zealand personnel, whom I dubbed the Holy Trinity, were engaged and set up in a large Auckland office block labelled by me as the White House. <clears throat> they were to handle all future corporate aircraft sales, even though they had no general aviation experience. It was destined to be a huge financial failure. I was removed from all flying responsibility and given a job driving around the country surveying the availability of chicken shit. If I could find enough, the idea was to turn it into fertiliser. Prior to this restructuring, I had almost concluded the sale of a second Super King Air to the Waddy Group and demanded that I follow this route to completion. 
the sale was highly successful, netting over $350,000 profit. The company refused to pay me all of my commission on the sale and instead split it with the Holy Trinity, claiming they were now part of the sales team. I began to plan legal action in an effort to recover the $10,000 involved, but events were to deny me that fight. Close to Christmas 1983, suddenly my flying career was cut short by a flying accident. I crashed during a display at a Tokara air pageant, severely burning my arms and face and breaking my neck. Here I am reminded of the statement by Justice Mann when he described the evidence presented to him during the Erebus inquiry as an orchestrated litany of lies. The organisers of the pageant had failed to adequately brief participating pilots of potential hazards. They rushed to protect themselves. Additionally, my accident provided an opportunity for those who had criticised my original around-the-world flight to discredit me. The official report of the accident is a complete falsification. Resulting psychological attacks on my character were far more difficult to overcome than the physical damage to my body. With Joyce's help, I won the fight to live. To summarise my activities as chief pilot, I was responsible for all flying movements. I delivered 110 aircraft to international clients and planned the flight of approximately 45 other aircraft flown by a variety of pilots drawn from the RNZAF and commercial field. In spite of an unacceptable number of unserviceabilities, there were no losses and perhaps more importantly, no major incidents to bring disrepute on the professional conduct of those New Zealand aviators who had the courage to engage in a most adventurous and somewhat hazardous exercise under very basic conditions. We were pioneers. I enjoyed the challenge of precise navigation with a minimum of equipment. I enjoyed the difficulties imposed upon me by mechanical failures and people. But I make no claim to being a natural born hotshot pilot. All of us had capabilities far exceeding that which society chooses to acknowledge. In its bid to suppress challenges to its hierarchical structure, society often discourages those individuals who would go beyond peer-imposed limitations. At the instigation of an Australian radio amateur, the Hamilton Radio Club, after my double crossing of the Tasman Sea in 1978, put my name forward for the honours list and I was awarded the MBE. I'm grateful to the few who have stood by me, but special thanks must go to my wife Joyce. Not necessarily a supporter of my somewhat non-conformist approach to life, but always loyal, it has been Joyce who has had to endure many years of worry, heartbreak, uncertainty and loneliness as I pursued an unusual and often dangerous career, attempting to prove that it is not the performer, but the performance that counts. I publicly thank her. And I thank you for listening. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you to the bravest lady. In the world. Yeah, yeah.